Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Alabama. is our church. This whole network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. Thank you. Well, it's very good to be back. You know, no matter where you go, or what the Lord accomplishes, uh, there's no place like home. And I, I think that's true of everybody who travels. Because you, you go someplace, you have a, a job to accomplish, and you do it, and everybody's wonderful, and things are beautiful, and mountains are high and but you know it just never seems to have what satisfies you the most until you get home and, and that's something we should all think about home many of us well many of us as child children didn't have much of a home like myself and a lot of people live in a house they don't live in a home you say, well, what's the difference? Well, there's a lot of difference, I think, because a home is a place. And it may be very poor, or rather shabby, but if those within love, and love each other, love the Lord, and you suffer together, cry together, and laugh together, talk together, it's family. And suddenly some kind of shabby looking house becomes a home. And some people live in mansions, but it's a house. We have two things I was going to talk about tonight. One was a kind of examination of conscience and preparation for Christmas. I thought you'd like that. <laughs> you may not if I do it. <laughs> the other was Elijah on Mon or at First Kings 18. Maybe I'll take a little bit of both. How's that? Because I don't think we examine our conscience too well. You say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, when was the last time you examined your conscience? You say, well, I went to confession. Oh, well, I won't ask you how long that was. But do we do that? As religious, we try to do that before we go to bed. You say, well, what is that? Well. You would say, what did I do today that was right, but what did I do that was wrong? Was I as patient as I should be? Well, our dear Lord gave us an examination of conscience, and I have yet to hear a sermon on it. It's called the seven woes. Oh, golly. But I thought I would take just the parts that me, belongs to you and I, although we're not scribes and Pharisees. Our dear Lord says, this is his examination of conscience in the seven woes of Matthew 23. I'm going to skip around a little bit tonight. <clears throat> I got a little jet lag. And since we're together, we're just going to skip around and see what is the Lord telling you and me as preparation for his birth? Well, what is the first jet? What is the first uh, woe? Woe is the last for you scribes and Pharisees. You hypocrites. Ooh. 
Boy, that's, a, that's terrible, isn't it, huh? You who shut up the kingdom of heaven in men's faces, neither going in yourselves or allowing others to go in. Now, what does that mean? Well, let's just uh, apply it, huh? <clears throat> if you're living a very immoral life, let's take that, okay? You're living a very immoral life. And your example is a bad example, very bad example. And your example makes others follow you. Oh, you see, that's what our Lord is saying. This is terrible. He said, you're not going to heaven. You don't want anybody else to go. And sometimes we don't realize that our lives can be a very, very bad example. So let's examine our conscience. It's my life, it's your life. A bad example. What is the second one our Lord says? <clears throat> he said, you who travel over sea and land to make a single convert. And when you have him, you make him twice as fit for hell as you are. <laughs> I'm reading the good word, everybody. I, <laughs> I'm not making this up. I mean, I... <sighs> And what does that mean? Well, all you people that are going around the world printing pornography books. Mm -hmm. From nation to nation, you print pornography books. And you go from this country to that country to that country. And you make, our Lord says here, you make everybody twice as fit for hell as you are. Oh, that don't sound too good, does it, huh? Wow. If you go down, he talks about people here swearing by the temple. Well, that's not too good. And down the other one, he says, you who pay your tithe of mint and dill and cumin and have neglected weightier matters, justice, mercy, and good faith. Is that true? Yeah, I think it can be, you know. You can give great money to the church and to United Fund. But you neglect justice, mercy, and good faith. Trust. Now, you could give a million dollars to a library. In my day, you know, there was the Mellon Library, and this library, and that library. And people gave millions of dollars to libraries. Wonderful. So say you gave a million dollars to a library. But your own life was so bad. Immoral, ungodly, atheistic perhaps, or hypocritical. Do you know what the Lord says? You blind guides, straining out gnats and swallowing camels. Now, what does that mean? Did you ever feel picky? <laughs> Women can get real picky. But so do men get picky over little things. You come home and your wife uh, <clears throat> burned the rose. There's not much for dinner and you're so angry. <sighs> you're angry, angry, angry. <clears throat> you're so angry with her. You walk out the door, you slam the door. What she doesn't know, you're making such a fuss over a burnt rose, you just finished committing adultery. Oh, wow. See, you strain a gnat and swallowed a camel. Ooh. See what I mean? In cheerily, you do evil things. Then you get angry over some, your kid. You know, 
hits the ball wrong direction and breaks a window. But maybe you just sold a million dollars. Nobody knows. It's a great exam of conscience. And I think we need to do this before the Lord comes. Get ourselves ready for a whole new year. What else did he say? He said, you who clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside is full of extortion and intemperance. Ah, oh, you see, you look nice. You dress well and you got a good position. You're chairman of the board or you're on a big board of directors. And, you know, everybody stands when you walk in a room. Well, let's see. You're full of extortion and intemperance. See? Now everybody thinks you're great inside. And our Lord said, clean the inside of the cup. And then the outside will be clean as well. You know, our Lord has a real knack of just getting to basics. Another one, he says, you who are like whitewashed tombs. You look handsome on the outside. All the rest of us that are ugly, we don't need to worry about this one, do we? You look handsome on the outside, but inside you're full of dead men's bones and every kind of corruption. You appear to people from the outside like good, honest men. But inside, you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Can that be true? <laughs> yeah, I can. I couldn't say this uh, applies to politicians. There have to be some good politicians somewhere. And they make a big to-do when they're campaigning. And then they vote for partial birth abortion. Do you understand the difference between the inside and the outside? Well, what else is our Lord say? He said, you who build the sepulchres of the prophets and decorate their tombs and then kill them. You kill them and then you build a tomb around them. Reminds me of old movies in the, when I was a kid. Movies were 10 cents. <laughs> I would do anything for 10 cents. Well, almost anything. And I'd go to a movie and you'd get these Chicago racketeers and they would kill somebody and then they'd send flowers and they'd all be there crying at the, at the wake. <laughs> Full of dead men's bones. You see what the dear Lord wants is us to be like him. He came to tell us the truth. He gave us a church that has a deposit of faith. He gave us sacraments, the Eucharist confession, it boggled the mind. All of that he gave us. He expects those sacraments to change us inside, to have a metanoia, a real change of life, so that we don't need to worry. That no one can have, see one thing outside and something terrible inside. And you know, sometimes when we're victims of things like that, we get kind of disheartened. And that's why I kind of thought of Elijah this morning, this evening. He lived with people that our dear Lord criticized. <laughs> and he got so discouraged. He had put all of, Je of Jezebel's prophets to the sword. That's one of the funniest things in the Old Testament. He got the people together and he said, if you worship the Lord God, then say so. So he got all the prophets of, of Jezebel and he said, look, 
you make a sacrifice and call upon your God. He put a, he took a, a cow and he split it in half and he put it on dry, dry wood. He said, you call upon your God and I'll call upon mine and the God who puts a fire to this cow, to this sacrifice will be the true God. So all the false prophets and God, they came together and they hopped and hippity hopped around and they cut themselves up and they yelled and screamed and lies in the corner, see? And he's saying, hey, maybe they want the lunch. Why don't you, well, yell a little louder? So they're yelling and screaming and they're bleeding all over. And he says, maybe they're sleepy. Wake them up. Well, nothing happened. So in those days, it was a great drought, you know, and he asked people for water, and he put water all over the woods, all over the cow, everywhere, three times. And he tried up to the Lord, and he said, Lord, show these people you are the one and only God. All of a sudden, the fire came down. <sighs> Ate up the cow, the wood, the whole thing. Now, wouldn't you think that would tell Jezebel something? Wouldn't you think she'd understand those prophets of hers were false? Uh-uh. What does she do? She says to Elijah, you know, this and this be done to me if you are not like these dead prophets by tomorrow noon. So what does Elijah do? Hmm. He ran. He fled for his life. He came to Beersheba where he left his servants and he himself went into the wilderness. And sitting under a bush, he wished you were dead. Did you ever feel like that? I mean, everything in your life has gone absolutely, totally wrong. Well, he's had a hard day. And he says, Yahweh, I have had enough. Take my life, I know better than my ancestors. Now oh, what a grouch, huh? This is a great prophet, one of my favorite prophets. He went to, I laid down and went to sleep. Now there he is, sound asleep, totally out of it, discouraged, depressed, running for his life, and an angel comes and touched him. He said, get up and eat. That way you would have wake me up. Don't you think you'd have woke up? Boy, I would have been wide awake. He looked around and there at his head was a scone baked on hot stones and a jar of water. Well, that would have been enough for me. He ate it and drank it. What did he do? He went back to sleep. <laughs> Don't you feel better? Angel, come a second time. He said, get up and eat, or the journey will be too long for you. We got up and ate and drank. And by the strength of two scones and two glasses of water, he walked 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Oreb. Hmm. I bet he was grouchy the entire way mumbling to himself, what am I doing this for, for goodness sakes? I'm already in trouble. Well, he finally got to Mount Oreb. He went into the cave, and spent the night in it. Then the word of Yahweh said, Elisha, what are you doing here? That's hilarious. <laughs> the Lord said to the angel twice, gives him strength to walk 40 days and 40 nights. And when he gets him to where he wants him, he says, what are you doing here? That would have sent me all the way back down the mountain. And Elijah says, I was filled with zeal for Yahweh because the sons of Israel have deserted you and broken down your altars and, and put your prophets to the sword and I'm the only one left. 
<laughs> and they want to kill me. And what does the Lord say? He's go out and stand on the mountain before Yahweh. Well, a mighty wind came, so strong the mountain shook. But Yahweh was not in the wind. You know all the people today, they run around making a lot of noise. Nation upon nation threatens nation upon nation. And they make a lot of noise. Yahweh's not there. And then a great wind came and an earthquake and God was not in the earthquake and a fire came and God was not in the fire. Isn't that what's wrong with the world today? There's wars and threats of wars and rumors of wars and everything seems to be gone. God is not in them. And then Elijah felt and heard the sound of a gentle breeze. A gentle breeze. And he covered his face with his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance. Now, can you imagine this? He has gone out and he has suffered an earthquake, a tornado. <laughs> the mountain shook. The wind almost knocked him off the, the, the mountain. And what does the Lord say? Elijah, what are you doing here? <laughs> you know, I think that's so funny. But doesn't that happen in your life, in mine? <laughs> You've all had a lot of problems. You've had tragedies in your lives. You've and the Lord always see in the New Old Testament and New Testament, in the New Testament our Lord kept saying, Why are you so frightened? Why do these doubts arise in your heart? And and the Father in the Old Testament say, What are you doing here? And the voice came and said and Elias said, I am filled with zealous with zeal for you. Because they've deserted you and broken down your altars and put your prophets to the sword, and I'm the only one left. Isn't that done today, huh? Isn't that a discouraging thought? So much of that is done all over the world. And Yahweh said, Go back by the same way to the wilderness. So our dear Lord had poor Elijah, was zealous, but the Lord says, go back, go back. In the New Testament, our Lord gives us an examination of conscience. Are we the same on the inside as we are on the outside? Are we fighting for truth? Are we satisfied with error? Are we fighting for the Lord, for his honor and for his glory? Or do we succumb? Are we zealous for the Lord like Elijah was? Are we complacent with the status quo? Are we really trying to be holy? Or we are satisfied with lukewarmness? Are we willing to suffer for the Lord? Are we willing to compromise? Do we really expect? Do we really desire to enter his kingdom and to be like Jesus? Or do we wish to be more satisfied? accepted by all. Well, I think between now and the great day of Christmas, the day that the Father sent His Son into our midst, 
to give us an example of holiness, to give us, show us the way and how to react and how to respond to the daily problems of our life. He went through everything we go through except sin. A little baby you can't be afraid of. We cannot be discouraged like Elijah was. We cannot be hypocrites like our Lord talked out to the scribes and Pharisees. We do one thing and we say something else. And we live one way and then we find fault. And they, we, we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. We need to do that. And no matter what happens in this world, we fight for the truth without fear. We desire holiness in spite of our weaknesses, in spite of our, our failures, our sinner condition. The fact we're created by God, we are bound by that creation to become like Him. When we die, our weaknesses will fall away like scales on a fish. And we will see him face to face. And we can afford, we can afford to suffer and to die for love of him. Because he gave us so much. He gave us prophets who had the same problems we have, but went on. He gave us Jesus who suffered everything we suffer, but never lost his serenity. He came in the world that was in darkness, in great error. And he came as a light to dispel the darkness. So, be of good cheer. We all have our problems, but no matter what they are and no matter how many times we fall, we can always go to confession and be cleaned again. We can accept the Eucharist, that body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus, and be renewed. And then we can sometimes you run and we're afraid, but no. We don't have to. We can admire Elijah and we can understand his weaknesses. But we are children of the New Testament, not the Old. We are children, adopted children of God himself through the sacrifice of Jesus. So examine your conscience between now and the first of the year. When Jesus comes on Christmas, ask him to give you the gift to always be strong, to always be faithful, and to always love Jesus. We have a call. Hello? Hi. Hi. Uh, where, are you, where are you from? Wisconsin. Good. And what is your question? Uh, I have a question and a, a prayer request. Uh, okay. My question is, um, I I know my conscience and, uh, you know, the difference between good and evil and that. Mm -hmm. But when I pray, pray for guidance, I, uh, I tend to get two answers, you know, uh, and, it's, and it's automatically, you know, I... Uh, Say if I, I ask for guidance to do one thing, I'll, I'll get a, a yes and a no, or a no and a yes, <laughs> you know, and it's, and it's very, I even pray for discernment. And, uh, and also, I'm, I'd like to ask you for prayers. I'm, I'm neck high in debt. I'm laid off, and uh, I was wondering if you and your sisters could please pray for me for my okay. uh, work and for my finances. I need, I need a miracle last week. Listen, you pray to Our Lady a Good Remedy. Will you do that? You probably don't have a prayer to her, but she, she will help you. Uh, she's very, it seems to be Our Lady Good Remedy's specialty. And you're having a hard time, and it's a hard time of the year. This is a hard time for everybody, for many, many people, especially the poor, especially the lonely. But we will pray for you. 
When we ask for discernment, we have to always be sure our conscience is an enlightened conscience. And I, I feel yours seems to be enlightened. What does that mean? It means that our conscience is formed by the truth in the church, by the magisterium. If my conscience is formed by that knowledge, I will always make the right decision. A kind of rule of thumb, if you want, is a decision comes along and you say, is it for the glory of God? Number one, is it for the good of my family? And is it for my good? And, and I think when we do that, many times we'll say, oh, I don't know. This decision, the wrong one, could really get me into trouble. I might be in the wrong company. So I would, I would, I would examine my conscience and see if I can, I can afford, if I have an enlightened conscience, to judge every decision on that level. Is it for the glory of God? Especially if we're looking at a job. If you're looking at a job when things are not right there, and you can be pretty sure if you take that job, you're going to be in trouble or at least in danger of grave temptation. So judge everything by the glory of God, the good of your family, and your good. And is it going to help you in your quest for holiness? See? And then you will always discern. And I would go before the Blessed Sacrament. You know, the Blessed Sacrament is our life. Our order is totally dedicated to the Holy Eucharist. And our sisters are before the Blessed Sacrament day and night to adore him, to love him, and to pray for all of you for him, to him. And we will pray for you, and I have to sisters to pray for your intentions tonight. We have another call. Hello? Hi, Mother. Hi, how are you? I love you, you very much. Thank you. I watch your show all the time with my father. Thank you. You did write him a letter, and you, and you wrote back. And um, I just wanted to tell you, that I kind of have a problem. Mm -hmm. My sisters aren't speaking. They haven't spoken for a while now. And um, my older sister, who's 22, she's jealous of my younger sister. And they're not speaking. And I was wondering if there's anything you could do to try to get them to speak, because it is the Christmas season. I know. And I'm very upset about it. I... <sighs> I think you probably have already talked to them. There may be a little jealousy there. It's very hard. Uh, I, I would just pray, and I'll have my sisters pray for you and your two sisters. It is a serious thing not to forgive each other. It's a serious thing uh, to go to bed at night. Our Lord said we should forgive before the sun goes down. And a lot of people just have hard hearts. You know, and and maybe they're just jealous of one another, or one is jealous of the other. Some kind of deep hurt, and hurts are hard to get over. And I think what they need most of all is prayer. And I would go if you can, before the Blessed Sacrament. Go before Jesus. He had forgave, and Our Lady forgave at the foot of the cross. You know, nobody thinks of Our Lady forgiving, but she had to forgive. When I dear Lord said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. Well, she had to say, yes, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they do. And you know, you might just go before the Blessed Sacrament and say to Our Lord, my two sisters just won't speak to each other. Would you give them the grace and the light, the light, to see how terrible it is not to speak to your own sisters around Christmas time? You know, we've become too materialistic about Christmas. I was glad to see at least some cards with the, with the baby and Our Lady and St. Joseph. We have totally forgotten whose birthday it is. It's just a kind of season you give gifts and you receive gifts. 
And the saddest thing of all, I think, is that we don't celebrate a birthday. Have you ever said to Jesus on Christmas Eve, Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. I bet you haven't. I bet you haven't even thought about it. But it's his birthday. So why don't you ask our dear Lord to give them the light to forgive. So as one family you can sing happy birthday to Jesus. In our busy life and in our travels, we had a very wonderful, wonderful opportunity in Spain. Uh, this great Archbishop of Toledo uh, opened up a, a new the only one in Spain, private-owned, a television studio and radio. And he takes all of our programs from satellite and fills up that television and radio with our program, our Spanish program. It was wonderful. And he invited me to be there on the dedication day. And then I, he asked me to unveil a plaque he had a red uh, cover on it, and I pulled the cord, and of course I pulled so hard, the whole thing fell over. <laughs> and I wanted to die on the spot. <laughs> but the plaque stayed on the wall, thank God. And uh, he even had our name, EWTN, on it. He was so grateful. Well, that was a wonderful, wonderful joy for us. A wonderful joy. And, and that day was filled with awe that there is a place now in another country that's going to air the kind of programs we need to teach each other to love, to forgive, and to be strong in the faith. We have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother. Oh, how are you from? I'm from uh, Chicago. And what is your question? Well, Mother, I'm, um, I'm gay mm -hmm. and find it difficult to be uh, gay and Catholic. And um, I was just wondering if you have any suggestions of uh, what I should do. Well, when a person says, I am gay, which you just said, I, it's hard to understand what you mean. Do you mean you have the inclination? Well, you can certainly be a very wonderful Catholic and have the inclination. Now, if you say you're actively gay, it's impossible. Why? Because to be actively gay is to commit grave sin. See? It is to go against the law of God. And I wish I could put it better for you. I wish I could soften it. But see, I, I really feel that there's something else. See, the sexuality is only one part of us. And, and there's so much, I'll bet, there's so much you can give to God. And, and even though you have an inclination and even though it, you find it very difficult to overcome, you can with the grace of God. And you can become very holy. A lot, that's why it's so important that we have the Eucharist. The Eucharist is that power within us to help us all overcome our faults and weaknesses. We all have faults and weaknesses. Some are angry when they were born, they're born angry. We all have a sinner condition to fight with. But you can't, don't get discouraged, please. Pray more. Do things for people that are ill, that are lonely. Uh, read some good books by the Holy Fathers, by the spiritual writers. That's a weakness you can overcome. And, and, and no one, for example, if someone says, well, I, 
like Robbie Banks. Well, <laughs> you see, he can't be a Catholic and be a, a very happy bank robber. You see, I, I cannot say I love God and then I'm willing to offend God. So I will pray for you. I don't know your name. But there are many gays who watch this network. I know you do because you're unhappy with yourself. But you can overcome. You can become a great, great saint because of the power of confession and the power of the Eucharist, body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you shall not have what in you? Life. Life. We have another call. Hello? Uh, yes, Mother. Where are you from? I'm from uh, Louisiana. My name is Debbie. What is your question? Uh, I have kind of an unusual situation, Mother. Um, I went back to my church about, a, a, it was a year ago, June. Um, I'm ashamed to say I did not most of my Catholic life uh, practice my religion. And Our Lady led me back, knowing I would need her a lot. And my husband left me in April. Um, then, on the Feast of Our Lady of the Holy Rosary, on October 7th, he passed away, 10 days before we were to be divorced. Mm. And I still loved him very much. Well, I have kind of two questions. The first question um, is in reference to something my father <clears throat> showed me in the Bible, which was Corinthians 7.12 that states about if a wife is a believer, it can help with her husband. My husband claimed to be an atheist um, and that her faith might be able to help with, you know, his soul. Uh, I'm worried about two things. I'm desperately worried about his soul and I'm also desperately worried about whether or not he was able to forgive me for anything that might have occurred that made him want to divorce me. And I know you have a lot of insight. You've helped a lot of people. Me, by the way, over the last few months, a lot. Yeah, well, I, 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 you're worried about something that's <clears throat> impossible to solve right now. You have to understand that God, all these years, obviously, you have been praying for him if he was an atheist. God sees all those prayers. I'm sure that he would have given him the opportunity to repent and to say, I believe. Uh, and if you focus this season especially on the child Jesus, he came as a child so we would have no fear. If I were you, between now and first of the year, I would go to the child Jesus and tell him, take care of him. We don't know in this life. Nobody can say where he went. And many people say they're at the atheists, but there's something in their heart they know. If he died hating God, well then, obviously, he made a choice, a wrong choice. But Jesus saw your prayers before he died, and he sees your prayers now. He saw your heart then, and he sees your heart now. He took all of that and gave your husband, I'm sure, the grace to say, I believe, and I'm sorry. We don't know. I would not torment yourself with those kind of questions. Your husband made a choice, and it was his choice. I would pray for him. I wouldn't stop praying for him. I wouldn't write him off, because we don't know. But I wouldn't allow it to occupy your mind and obsess your thoughts. When he saw Jesus, 
And if you were saved, if he repented, anything you did to him would not be of any consequence. We, we don't carry all of this load of weaknesses and failures to heaven. We don't even carry them to purgatory. What we carry is the result and the effects of those sins on our soul. And then we have to be purified. I would pray for him. You know, you don't know. Don't write him off. Say, Jesus, if his soul is saved, I pray for him. Say a rosary. We don't know. Say, you weren't there when he died. You were separated some months. And I, I would just thank our dear Lord that you weren't divorced, that you didn't have to go through that. And I would start to live your own life. You become holy now. You spend more time with the Lord. You read a little bit on the spiritual life. Get your own soul in order. That part of your life is gone. You can't bring it back. You have your own life to live now. We have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother. Nice. Um, this is such an honor to be uh, talking to you. Thank you. Um, and welcome back. Thank you. I am very, <laughs> I feel very wonderful back. Oh, I think it, it, seeing you is like having Christmas start now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, I am a, a person who goes to confession um, at least uh, uh, twice a week, usually once a week, um, and I receive the Eucharist uh, regularly. Mm -hmm. I'm the mother of four children. The oldest is seven and the youngest is uh, going on two years old. Um, I just want to say that I just want you to, I was hoping you could give me um, guidelines as to um, <clears throat> bringing joy to my family as a mother mm -hmm. during this Christmas season. I grew up uh, um, in a very uh, depressed home. Well, it was de depressed on the holidays, um, <laughs> meaning my, 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 I had one parent who was always depressed. And I found it necessary to bring joy into the into the holidays, um, and whatever joy I brought, I was um, I was criticized, and so I've you know became a perfectionist mm -hmm. and on and on. I, I know I'm, this is the Oprah Winfrey show, but that's sort of <laughs> in, in, yeah. in a nutshell. Um, so uh, my my uh, mother uh, basically turned her back on her family taught us who were the good people and who were the bad people in the family and all. This persists, and, um, you know, I'm, I am living in Christ. I am, like, sh shielding my children, sending them to, the, to an incredible Catholic school, um, um, uh, which is, is uh, well, I can't say enough about it. And um, they are truly living in the Lord. But... I guess my question is, how would my mother fit into my Christmas environment now um, <laughs> with my children because of her bringing the depression and the sadness? And the does, she, does she live with you? No, she doesn't. She lives a few states away. All right, and, and she's not coming for Christmas, is she? Uh, well, she says that uh, she has to be part of the family or I will not see the kingdom of God. What does that mean, though? Is she coming for Christmas? Uh, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> she's not? No, she's not. And it's very hard for me to say, no, you're not coming. But I just say, oh, I'm just going to... Oh, husband I and wouldn't, I no, I wouldn't feel guilty, honey. You're, you know, um, my own sweet mother was never happy on holidays. And I think some people just have a habit of being unhappy on holidays. And, and no matter what you do, you can't. I would not allow, uh, you, you should pray for your mother. Pray for her. But don't not, you, you belong, you have husband now, you have children. And what is your duty before God? That's what you gotta think about. You, you have to leave mother, father, brother, sister home when you're married. You now have a family. And that family must, and you're already doing it. You're, they're living a beautiful spiritual life and have that advent. See, we, we don't pay attention to advent. 
Now, tell the kids, get ready. He's coming. He's coming. I, I, you have to say it in your heart every day. He's coming. But when you say that alone, you get excited. See? And, and every morning, you say, hey, kids, he's coming. And you say, who's coming, Mom? She said, Jesus is coming. That's how you keep that family full of joy. I would pray for your mother, but you are obliged by the Lord. Now, to stay with your family, to keep your family in the right spirit, and, and to feed your family with that Advent spirit. I heard someone say the other day, oh, I'm so depressed. Why? Oh, well, you know, I just have no Christmas spirit. Well, it's not Christmas yet. How are you going to have a Christmas spirit when he isn't even here yet? You have an Advent spirit. And the, the divine office is when it's on the 17th. Oh, Emmanuel. Oh, wisdom. Oh, key of David. It, it's awesome. He's coming. I bet by the end of next year, we'll be saying he's coming for sure. See, we have to have an Advent spirit. And I think we have to have an Advent spirit all our lives. I'm 74. He's coming. <laughs> I hope he waits about 10, 11 years. However, <laughs> you old people ought to get up in the morning and say he's coming. See, we, we, we can't let the world and people and things depress us. Goodness gracious. They're like puffs of smoke, wind, balloons in the air. You can't allow anything to disturb your spirit at this time. And then on the 17th to the 25th, 24th, he's coming. He's around the corner. That's how you make your kids understand the spirit of Christmas. The Advent is it's extremely important. And the Holy Father calls these next two years an Advent for the coming of Jesus. So I think you're doing well. I know you feel bad your mother's that way. But family doesn't mean we're all depressed. When somebody's depressed, you get them out of depression. That is not togetherness. You have your family, you be filled with Advent. And may you all be have that awesome spirit of desire. He's coming for each one of us. And now we have just a few more days and I want your donation to come. <laughs> I had a little hard getting that one together. But anyway, um, I have a little thing on the air. It says, put us between your gas and electric bill. And people have been sending me the electric bill. Well, I can't pay your electric bill. I wish I could. But that's just a little thing to remind you that this is our biggest month. If it isn't, we're in trouble the rest of the year. So please, be generous, will you? And let Jesus know you're grateful for all he has done for you through EWTN. We need your gift this month, in the month of January, in order to keep going for another year. And every month, we need your assistance, somebody's assistance. You've been most generous, most wonderful audience. And you always, through God's providence, provide us just what we need month after month. And it's a thrill for me to run this whole place in a really, truly Franciscan way. But don't let anything in your life, whether it's pain or heartache or whatever, ruin your advent. The advent that says over and over, O oh, Emmanuel. Come. Come. Everybody wants to be wanted. So does God. He wants you to look forward to his coming. And so this is a very exciting time of year. Don't let anyone spoil it for you. 
because he's coming. And to me, the joy of Christmas is so different, you know, than Lent. But the joy of Christmas is this Advent, this anticipation. The Lord is coming. And then Christmas Eve, the Lord is here. God bless you.